best game ever. You know, truthfully, the second thing you make, it's gonna be better than the first thing. Your first thing's gonna suck. The second thing's gonna suck compared to the third thing. The fourth thing's gonna suck compared to the fifth thing. So, uh, you know, we're getting ready to release um, Zombie Pumpkin Slayer to the stores, and we're thinking about doing in-app purchases, mm -hmm. but we don't really know what's gonna work yet for maximizing purchase conversions. Do we just iterate on that? Do we- Yeah, get it out there. Do we try out. some first, and then we start kind of analyzing our anal analytics and saying, hey, what are people purchasing? What are they not purchasing? Yeah, that's exactly the way you do it. You know, you could get a focus group of a thousand people in a room, get a giant stadium, buy pizza, test everyone out, have them write an awesome feedback, or you could just put it out there. Let it get a thousand downloads in the store and monitor those people's, what they're doing implicitly. Do it automatically in the background, just as they're playing and using the app. Even if they don't like the experience, you'll collect that data that they didn't like it or that they quit, and that will help you determine, oh, hey, when they get to level three, everyone quits. Why is that? Well, it's because they died five times without getting on. Oh, we need to make it easier, or we need to add more health packs, or we need to figure out some other way to balance it. The sooner you get out, the quicker you can do that iteration. So if I'm serious about making money, then I need to have analytics embedded in my game. Absolutely. So something like Flurry or, I'm, I keep, you know, that's the major one. There, there are a way. lot of different solutions out there. You can even make your own in Azure fairly easily. Right. You can just throw up a PHP page, uh, you know, do a different call to it, throw a different tag. It can be as simple as that. It doesn't really need to be all that fancy. You just need to track the metrics you care about. You know, hey, when are people dying? When are they starting the next level? How long are they playing before they quit? That kind of stuff. And you just need to start doodling. You just need to start getting your game out there and getting another game out there and start developing over and over and over again. And the more you develop, the better you're gonna be as a developer, just with every skill you're gonna do. It applies with marketing too. The first time you try marketing a game, not gonna be as good as the second time. You just have to keep marketing over and over. You keep experimenting over and over and finding what works. And it's okay to do something that doesn't work. You can just try again and do something else later or even take the same thing and iterate on it. And again, these games took years to make, years of iteration, years of being out there before they were successful. Wasn't Flappy Bird on the stores for like eight or nine months before it hit number one? Yeah, it seems right. Yeah, it, it was on for a while before it reached the top. So it is absolutely like never too early, I think, to get out there and build that community, build your audience, and just start practicing. Yeah, talking about you know preparing for success, Flappy Bird was an overnight hit, and I think it kind of overwhelmed the developer a little bit, and he had to pull the game from the store because he didn't know, he wasn't set up to handle that. So yeah, he it wasn't quite point. ready yeah. for his success necessarily. Right. There's also an argument that you know he pulled back and then everyone wanted to talk about it, everyone wanted to talk about the next thing, and right. then he comes out with this next game, and it hits up in the media everywhere, right? So yeah. it was kind of a strategic decision there. It's like, hey, I don't need to deal with this right now. I want to focus on what's important to me. He wasn't just worried about, I'm getting this many downloads now. He was worried about long-term. You know, how is he going to set up him's indie development in the future? Uh, and that applies to all developers. It's not just about that short-term, how do I get downloads right now? How do I get known right now? The first things first is make your game great. Once you have a great game, once you have a perfect game, then you can start pushing it. Then you can start marketing it. You don't need a million users right now when you're starting out. You need a few users who are going to give you really good feedback, who are going to iterate on it, who are going to polish it. If you have a game that monetizes really, really well with only a thousand players, it's easy to scale that up to a million players because you're monetizing well. It's doing that math, like I said earlier, where you can start ramping up the advertisement. But if you're not monetizing well, million, 10 million, 1,000, it doesn't make a difference. Well, um, I hope that was, uh, you learned something about marketing and monetization. If you have any questions about that, I love getting questions. You can tweet me at Tobiah Marks or go to my blog, TobiahMarks.com, where I have a bunch of articles and information. Uh, Jason as well, you're Jason yep. G. Fox on yeah, Twitter. at Jason G. Fox. So, you know, ask us questions. Uh, it was a really hard topic to kind of condense in 50 minutes. There's so many different aspects to touch on. I know I went kind of fast, but hopefully you guys learned something and found it interesting. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break.
uh, and stick tuned for module number nine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back. Hope you had a good quick break after that last session. I know, uh, again, I keep mentioning every session, I'm very, very excited to be here. Yep. And I'm back again today for the first time today with my good friend Dave Oils again for our next session in developing 2D and 3D games with Unity on Windows, Prime 31, and Azure Mobile Services. How to do cool things like leaderboards by using the cloud in your application. Okay, absolutely. Uh, like Adam said, we're going to get started with uh, one of my favorite topics, and that is uh, Azure Mobile Services. And like I said, how to get uh, tied in with your Unity game in particular. Um, so I spent some time kind of creating, uh, uh, working with Prime 31 and creating, uh, best to say, a sample to kind of work with your developers uh, so you can better understand how to get this working within your application itself. Prime 31 providing, of course, a uh, year of free plugins for Unity for the Microsoft platform, yep. be it uh, their Essentials plugin, do things like Live Tiles, which we'll actually look at the next session, mm -hmm. Azure Cloud Integration, uh, in-app purchases, things like that. So free for one year from prime31.com. Absolutely. Uh, so quick module overview. We're going to be doing things like an uh, intro to the Azure plugin, creating your first mobile service in Azure, uh, understanding how Unity handles DLLs is a very eccentric and sometimes com uh, complicated method, so we'll work with you to get that done. Eccentric, indeed. <laughs> uh, we'll understand how to install the, pro the plugin, compile our actual project, as well as walk you through bits of the code. It can seem a bit difficult at times, but once you break it down into small, digestible bits, you'll have a much, much better understanding of how it works, along with the uh, functions available to us. They're very, if you're familiar with link um, or, or search queries, you'll be uh, familiar with this as well. And finally, we'll wrap things up with um, what other options exist for developers out there. So without further ado, um, let's get started with Very an cool. intro to the Prime 31 plugin. It's like Adam mentioned before, it is, uh, Prime 31 has a partnership with Microsoft um, to allow many of his, uh, his plugins to be free for us for over the next year. So I highly suggest head over to prime31.com and check cool. them out. They're normally like $70, $80 plugins. Um, work, right now, this plugin runs across the Windows 8 store. Uh, the phone should follow shortly. We're working with Unity right now to get that built in too. Um, it will run inside the Unity editor, but you will not be able to actually connect to Azure itself. Again, go to prime31.com slash plugins to find it. Uh, I'll take you there real quick to give you a better understanding of what the uh, navigating it actually looks like. Prime 31. We'll take a look at this. So the plugins page. Uh, you can't download the plugins directly through the app, uh, through the site itself. What happens is I go to Windows Store right here. You see all the available plugins. You see Download Now, Download, Buy on the right-hand side. And what happens if I go to click on these, for example, the uh, Microsoft Azure plugin, click Download, I'll have to first register. So it's my name, first and last, and my email address. And then after I actually register, I'll receive a link in my email to download any of these plugins. I've already gone ahead and done that. So let's take a step back into the PowerPoints and understand how to get this integrated with our project. So it's also a great time to uh, take a step back and understand we need to download uh, the Azure Mobile Services SDK before we continue with this. So this does allows our Visual Studio project to then talk to the Azure Mobile Services backend. Um, it's a NuGet package. So if you uh, down take a look at these slides immediately following this talk, or if you do a quick Bing search, for Azure Mobile Services SDK, you can download it there, as well as from Visual Studio. I've gone ahead and done that already, so I'll save us the time there. So now, creating an Azure Mobile Service. So first of all, you're probably wondering, what is a mobile service for Azure? Well, first thing we can do is head to our Azure portal. And what that'll do is uh, allow us to take a view of what's going on here. So go to Azure portal. So it's manage.windowsazure.com. When I click on that, it'll actually bring me to my portal, which you can already see here in just a moment. 
I love that little progress bar. Yeah, and we have actually a very nice preview that uh, the Azure team is working on right now, too. I don't want to get too complicated, uh, so I decided to just stick with the simple one we have at this moment, but in the very near future, you're going to see what else they are working on. So on the left-hand side here, here are all the services that are available to me as a Microsoft developer. So most commonly, I'm checking out websites, uh, but in this sample, I'm going to keep it simple, go back to mobile services on the left-hand side. They even have a little mobile device, so you have a better understanding. And if I'm going to create a new service, I'll go right here in the bottom left corner on this new button. Click New. Compute is the first thing that pops up on my left-hand side, followed by Mobile Service, and then Create. So now I'm prompt with another pop-up. I can then enter the URL that I want for this mobile service. It's not really going to matter because no one is ever going to see this except for you as the developer. So I could do something like um, test uh, mobile service. And then it's going to uh, add uh, .azure mobile net at the end. So obviously this name's already taken. I'm not going to create a new one here because we currently have one. But generally what I'm going to do is create a uh, new 20 megabyte SQL database. And the region is where you're located at this point in time. So I'm based out of Philadelphia, therefore most of my servers come from uh, the East US region. And finally, the back end, you can use JavaScript, which then relies on Node.js, or you can use the uh, newer .NET version uh, for other services, but for this particular plugin, it still requires the JavaScript version. So we'll stick with this for now. Once I make this plugin, or this uh, Azure mobile service, I'll then be prompted with this beautiful screen right here. So you see, the one I've gone ahead and made for all of you to, uh, to use on your own is called Unity Win 8 Test. Click on that. And now I can see which platform I actually want to hit here. So I can make uh, different backends for different platforms. You can have Windows, iOS, Android. And this is uh, continuously going towards Microsoft's idea of uh, slowly becoming platform agnostic and working with developers of all brands and all kinds. That's pretty cool. Seeing all those different platforms listed on there is uh, pretty amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. And the fact it works so seamlessly across uh, different platforms, web services such as HTML5 and JavaScript. So if you're ever confused at this point, we have Getting Started, which shows you exactly how simple it is to actually connect and run our app. And I'll even create a little uh, sample demo app for C Sharp or JavaScript for us. But up here on the top, I can find data, where I can see the leaderboard that I've already created ahead of time. So if I'm following along with some of my tutorials, uh, which I also have on my site, um, I have many pictures of this, and you can see I'm constantly updating my leaderboard. So again, this is open to anybody who has access uh, to mobile services at this point. This way they can add, remove, update scores. On the left-hand side here, we have an ID, which is automatically generated by Azure on its own. We also have a score, which is an integer, and a username. These are simply here to keep track of who is actually doing very well on our leaderboard at this point. So you can see I've already thrown some values in there. I've kind of manipulated them going along the last couple of weeks. Uh, but I've kind of kept them all between, uh, beneath a certain number. So kind of under 200. Built-in fields ID created at, yes. updated that version. Those are ones you don't touch. You don't have no control over, all done on the server side by Azure. Absolutely, that's correct. So even more up here, you can see we have things like script, where I can add my own private functions in the back end if I want to manipulate this data in some way. We're not going to cover that today, though. I also have permissions. So, uh, Adam, have you ever worked with Azure Mobile Services and permissions at all? I have. In fact, when you mentioned about um, the scripts on there, it's kind of cool to note that it was initially provided you Node.js scripts that you could write on there. So okay. you could use server-side JavaScript to do Node.js scripts. Uh, and then they finally uh, released .NET scripts that you can have available on the server-side as well. So really cool technology. Perfect. So you really got the best of both worlds. Like you said, if you're a .NET developer, you should feel right at home. But if you're also a web developer, JavaScript will work just as fine. So nice permissions we have here. We have this leaderboard. Okay, Say we're integrating into our, our Windows Phone or Windows 8 or even iOS and Android Unity game. We may not want to um, open them up to anybody because if someone had, had an opportunity to decompile or open our code, they could then access these leaderboards and perhaps manipulate um, either the names or the numbers at some point. So what we can do is we have table permissions here on the left-hand side. So you have insert, update, delete, and read. These are also functions that we'll have available to us within the plugin itself. And right now I have it set to anybody with the application key can open this up and manipulate the data. So look at these tables and these keys as really um, 
the URL or endpoint is essentially a door or an address to a location, and the key is exactly what it sounds like. It's the key to get through that door. I notice in the list there, everyone that could be a potentially dangerous drop down to have enabled. <laughs> that could. Unless that you could. want that, right? You can Absolutely. Have everyone available to insert data in your application that surely could work. Right. But in this particular case, I decided to leave it open for everyone to leave it as simple as possible for developers to get started with. Uh, so we have authenticated users. Um, you can also use uh, a number of authentication services for Azure. Various OAuth providers will integrate on Azure. Actually, a whole plethora of OAuth providers will actually integrate with Azure, so you can do all authentication 